Okay, so it's 4 p.m. local time, at least in Berlin. And um, for this week's um, session of the Akashnaka, I welcome Jennifer Snow in uh, Virginia. So um, what time is it where you are right now? Oh, it's 10 a.m. A wonderful good morning to you. And I'm so glad to be here. And it's great to connect. Uh, I think the last time I saw members of your team was uh, two years ago at Softworks. So this is really delightful to be back in touch. Thanks for me. So I'm, I'm very looking forward to the next 30 minutes we have today. Um, we are talking because you are the CTO of FWorks, which is the base unit of the US Air Force. And also why this is quite special for us is, I don't know if you're actually aware of this, FWorks for us is like the bright example of how an innovation unit could be like. Um, oh, because you we were up on it, I think, both in 2017. Um, and um, But you have quite a different scope in many things. And um, yeah, many, many interesting topics, methods also, and tools that you're using. And uh, this is mainly the reason why we're talking here. Um, and um, because, yeah, I'm, I'm just curious how things work. Um, but so, so first of all, I'm wearing a uniform, you aren't, but you're actually Lieutenant Colonel of the Air Force, right? I am, I am. And, you know, a lot of times uh, we will engage publicly like this in civilian clothes, because in some cases we've found, especially when we're working with our hacker and maker communities, when you walk in in a uniform, sometimes the uniform gets in the way of a positive conversation. People see the uniform walk in before you. Uh, and so we've adopted a lot of these uh, strategies to make people comfortable around us. And it's actually worked really well. And they start to realize that, hey, even if I show up in uniform now, I'm still JJ. And so people will come up and they're a lot more comfortable when they encounter me like this first. Because they don't see the rank and everything, because that's something right. like very, very deep in a soldier's mind to look at the shoulder, shoulder pieces first, right? <laughs> yes, and when I show up as a Lieutenant Colonel, everybody kind of goes quiet. And when I show up like this and I'm just like, hey, let's talk, let's collaborate. I want to hear your thoughts. And they know me as JJ, not Lieutenant Colonel Snow right off the bat. The ideas that come up are amazing and the discussions are fantastic. So that's why we do it. Yeah. Um, so just for our viewers and listeners, this is a live session. So everyone has the chance to, to enter questions in the Q&A panel on the right hand side. And then these questions will be displayed to me and then I can yeah, forward them and address them to JJ um, during the course of, of uh, this talk. But first of all, just to get started, um, so I've, I've said FWorks is the innovation unit of the US Air Force. Um, what is your mission statement? What, what are you trying to, to achieve first? And maybe we can start with this. Yeah, yeah, sure. So we, we keep it really simple. Our mission and values are focused around the same thing. We're really looking at how can we solve problems and enhance efficiencies for the Air Force, but then also some precedents that can be adopted by our allied partners, by our international partners, and the DOD writ large. So that's really where we're focused. And then secondarily, driving a culture of innovation from inside the government out. And just maybe to, to continue this point, when you were um, founded in 2017, what were the points that led to it? Maybe what were the persons behind it or maybe the, the overall condition, what led to you know, people thinking, okay, we need an innovation unit within our Air Force, for example. So that's sure. a really, that's a, a great story. Um, so Secretary Gertz, Hondo Gertz, actually had founded Softworks as a partnership intermediary agreement. And we saw Softworks coming together. I was actually part of that team before I joined the Air Force team. and. The results were really impressive. Um, the transitions to program of record, the success stories that were coming out of there. And so at that point in time, Dr. Brian Mao, who, who's our director, came down and said, look, um, we want to do this for the Air Force. Can you help us set up something similar? And so he spent three weeks with us and he talked with our entire team. And the cool thing about the works model is that it's um, it's out of the box, which means any organization can adopt it to what their requirements are. It's very easy to set up. You can typically set up a, a works node in about 45 days and have it up and running with the right team, focused on the right requirements to support your customer. That's so, uh, what I'm excited about. So when, what's the core of the works model? 
Sure, sure. So we have a really cool holistic ecosystem. It's a bit different than Softworks or MGM Works or any of the other works, but it's really tailored to what we wanted to drive within the Air Force. So we've got four key components. The first one is Spark. Spark is all about driving a culture of innovation inside of the Air Force for our airmen. This is where our airmen can come in with a problem at the tactical level. It doesn't matter what it is. They come into our spaces and they pitch the problem in the hopes that they're going to get access, expertise, funding support to solve that. In many cases, they'll come in and they'll have identified an area where we can gain significant efficiencies, uh, where we can have time savings, where we can actually save lives. And so we want to encourage them to come forward. And Spark Tank has been really, really successful in doing that. We also do a Spark Collider, where we have airmen and, uh, and our senior members coming together with private sector, uh, academia, and hackers and makers around unique problem sets. And those have been tremendous as well. So you actually help the airmen that come in and report problems, for example, you help them solving them and maybe give them resources to do so? That's right, that's right. So they can come in and pitch a, a problem that they're having and say, look, um, we're having issues on the flight line tracking certain types of tools. Some of these tools get lost. We wanna make sure that we're able to account for them. We don't want them to necessarily wind up in the engine of an aircraft. How can we best track them and tag them? And if we do lose them because we have to turn them back in, is there a way to RFID chip them so that we can locate them and make sure that we didn't misplace? Or it could be something as simple as that, or it could be uh, protection of the force and family where we're talking about exceptional family members. These are families that have children that have special medical needs or special schooling needs. And typically it would take them sometimes a year to process all the paperwork for their move. And that could actually cost them the move. They might not be able to move to their next assignment in time and they would miss their opportunity at that job. Uh, one airman stepped up and said, look, I believe we can do this in 45 days or less. And he gave us a digital example of how to do that. That's powerful. That's the kind of uh, solution that we're looking for. So that okay. focuses on our airmen specifically. We also yeah. have three other areas. So the second area is our AFWorks hub. We have three of these. We've got a DC hub, we've got a hub in Las Vegas and one in Austin, Texas. These are our physical collaboration spaces. We also do virtual events there, but these are kind of the friendly front doors where anybody can walk in with a problem or solution and say, hey, we wanna team up with you. And that's where our big events happen. Our base of the future event is coming up. We're virtualizing that, but that'll be held by our Vegas, our flagship location. And then the other two that I think are really interesting that um, are definitely different from any of the other models I've seen are Air Force Accelerator and then Air Force Ventures. These are unique in that the idea behind them is making sure that we move faster to get the best technologies into the hands of our warfighter in a much shorter time period using agile tools, but also alongside of private sector partners. And this is a, a definite difference. That's certainly extremely interesting because when I compare it to the organization that we are having, as I said, we're also born in 2017 plus minus um we do have what we call an entrepreneurship program which is a little like your spark program i guess so we have um innovation challenges we have people coming in reporting problems and mostly it's the soldiers at the tactical level who know best where the problems are where the pain points are so they can report it to us and then what we try to do is okay we help them shape the problem and help them shape the solution and also give them mentors and the tools and the resources to, to work on this. So I think that's a little comparable. We don't have three hubs, we have one hub, um, which I'm actually physically in right now. Um, I love those, it. Those two things are quite comparable, I guess. But now when you talk about the accelerator and the ventures, uh, I think this is something that, yeah, as you said already yourself, is maybe a little different. Um, so maybe you can just explain to us, um, yeah, what those two columns are actually doing and how you are collaborating also with, with the industry and all this. Definitely. So um, the AFWorks accelerators, these are nodes that are scattered around the country right now. And the idea is by having presence, even if it's a one or two person team, we can do outreach to local technology companies that are typically not accessible to the government. And it, it's done on a face-to-face -face basis and by that location. 
But the cool part is it allows our program managers to rapidly identify technology solutions that will grant us a competitive advantage and onboard them very quickly into our ecosystem. Um, it's like having a bunch of sensors all around the United States to find the best of breed technology. And then once they do get onboarded, that's where AF Ventures comes in. So Air Force Ventures is a really cool concept. Uh, Dr. Roper put that in place under SAF AQV. And I gotta tell you, um, I'm really impressed because here you're taking private sector funders, so venture capital, and having them team up on projects of interest outside the government. So for example, we had a heads up display. Um, and in this particular case, it was definitely of interest to us because it helps with cognitive overload in a combat environment. Uh, it also helped to clarify some of the data streams that we wanted to clarify for our pilots. And it, it was really clean. And so um, the command that was entrusted put down 300,000. Um, we had a, a small business innovation research uh, loan that was given for 300,000, so 600,000. And then a private sector venture capital group said, look, we see a dual use uh, application for this. It also touches, you know, private sector transportation, and there were some other functionalities that they were interested in. They invested another 600,000. We had 1.2 million that we were able to move this project forward with very quickly, and the money was flowing from both sides equally. Now, that doesn't always happen. What we've also done with our incubators, accelerators, and private sector VCs is team up with them in such a way that they may see dual use applications on the commercial side, which enables the companies to stay competitive, definitely something we want. And they're starting to get the funding stream there where on the government side, we can typically get a, a CIBR or a scientific tech transfer for research turned in about 45 days or less. The longer funding streams, if you're talking about a program of record, still can take a year, sometimes 18 months. If that's happening, we want the company to still continue to grow. So they're receiving private sector funds and growing and staying competitive. And then as our money comes online, they're able to address more topics. And frequently we're finding that because of this really cool synergistic relationship, we're developing more robust technologies that are cross-cutting and benefiting the entire Department of Defense. But during the like, course of the company getting the product more mature and maybe getting all the input from academia and, and the VC side, for example, are you also already at that stage bringing it to the soldiers and able, in, in order to, to try it out, to test it, to, to give their review and, and recommendations? Yeah, so in a lot of cases, um, in order to enter for a, a CIBR or an STTR, you have to have a, um, a sponsor from one of our commands. So a program executive office or a, one of our Air Force customers will stand up and write a memorandum of understanding and say, look, we want a team with this particular company or this particular innovator because they have a solution that solves a problem for us. Yeah. In order to move from a phase one, which is 50,000 to start, to a phase two, which it varies as far as how much you can get, and then move on to a phase three, we're really intentional about setting a relationship with an end user because we want it to successfully transition and we want that program to keep going forward. If they come in and they hit a phase one, they get the 50K, but there's no customer interest, well, we help the company develop, but that also tells them that they don't have a good application for us. And that's yeah. okay. Not every company will, but yeah. it gives us a place to stop because that way we're not investing in wrong technologies. We're constantly iterating with our customer in mind, and they're telling us, yes, this will work. No, this won't. Here's why. So these are the four columns. Um, that sounds like a lot of work. How many people do you actually have in your staff there? So it, it varies. We, we've got um, typically around 25 uh, different folks. Almost all of us are military. We do have some contract and civilian support too. We look like we're getting ready to grow to about 60 people. So still not a really big organization, but Remember, we have this tremendous ecosystem, and yeah. I think that's something that um, a lot of people overlook, the power of the ecosystem. Because we've built um, a really friendly front door, we have people constantly plugging in from private sector, sector academia, hackers and makers, tech experts. 
that we can tap and say, look, we're having this issue. Can you come help us? And right. oftentimes they will be there that same week, that same day and jump in. That serves as a, a, a true force multiplier for us because that ecosystem, that's our friendly neighborhood, that's our community. And we can reach out to them at any time and ask them for help and they jump right in. And it, it's been really incredible to see that because what you're doing is you're taking a small team and yeah. making it much more powerful than it normally would be. So that's the whole of FWorks, like around 60 people. Wow, that's impressive. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's what, so we're growing to 60 people. We're not there yet. Yeah, okay. Um, because that's roughly comparable to our size. Um, I mean, we don't have the Air Force specific focus. We are like across all branches. Um, right. But you said the key was to build a friendly front door, especially to academia and industry and, and um, investors and capital companies and startups, but also to the public sector. Like how, how yes. did that work? Because I mean, um, you've told us about the genesis of FWorks and you know how it came to life. Um, and how you had a good role model already with softworks doing like comparable thing for the for the special operation forces. Um, but I can also assume that not everybody was too happy about it or like how, how did you know the the public sector environment react to all right. this? That's a great question because anytime you bring in innovation, there's always a, a group of antibodies that spring up because innovation means change and change can be scary. So one of the approaches that we've done, and this was really intentional, is we do a bottom up, top down approach, because typically where you encounter the most resistance is that middle management level. That's where people are really concerned about, oh, if this changes, I'm going to have to relearn something or I might lose you know, the control or power I have over this portion or this program or this program might go away altogether. Then what happens to me? Instead, we've had to get the, the lowest levels excited about this as a tool to solve their problems. So our junior enlisted, our junior officers, um, our junior civilians come forward, they see how this is solving a problem for them and they get excited and they start to push. At our senior most levels, we've got some of the best leadership out there and they have been pushing for innovation across portfolios, across different sectors, and they continue to do so. And having that top cover is key. The other thing is, We've been set up adjacent to. So while we're part of the Air Force, most of our operations are happening in parallel, which gives the Air Force an opportunity to see us in a non-threatening light. When you see a tool over here that's actually really cool, and you're doing a process here that maybe is a bit more time consuming, but it's not directly in competition, sometimes you're willing to try this one out. And when you do, you're like, oh, I, I really like that one better you realize it's not going to take away a job. It's not going to take away any power. It's not a threat. In fact, it's a win for everybody. And so a lot of the, um, the transformational pieces that we've done that are a bit more radical have happened because we've been really considerate in doing parallel or adjacent innovation to show people, hey, this isn't something that's meant to be a replacement or meant to take away from you. In fact, it's going to enhance you and make you even better at your job. And that's helped a lot. Maybe in that context, I can forward a question from Tarek, who's asking, sure. do you see strict military hierarchies as an asset or impediment when it comes to developing innovative solutions? Oh, that's a good one. Um, it depends on the topic, right? Um, so in some cases, we've had some really great success in moving uh, technologies through from the tactical level. The tactical level user gets super excited about them and they become our best advocate. They actually will get in front of their leadership and say, look, we need this, here's why. And they've already done all the, all the hard work and just for us. Yeah. Always happen though. Sometimes you'll walk into a room and um, if you don't have a familiar narrative, if you can't immediately articulate to senior leadership or to a specific command, how this helps them to solve a problem, you're going to hit a lot of speed bumps and a lot of friction. Um, that can really be a challenge. And so I think it goes back to um, having an innovation narrative that speaks to everybody and making sure that you're clearly communicating that up front and showing people, hey, here's how we can help you. Here's how we can amplify your success. And you get the win, take the tool, test it out, let us know how we can help. That's been... Um, one way that we've broken through a lot of the barriers when, when you're dealing with different layers in a bureaucratic organization. 
Does it always work? No, sometimes it can be very painful, uh, but that's part of the innovation experience too. I hope that answers your question. I think it does, um, but I can just blend in with another one there because that's from Alexander and he says, if you look at AppWorks compared to maybe other branches, um, especially in sort of the AppWorks um, area of operations, you have multi domains um, you have to cover. So quite a complex field really of, of theaters that you look at. Um, so what are the challenges when you look at like new military multi-domain um, developments? How, how can you cope with all the scope of things going on there, especially you as a CTO there? <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. So, um, you know, and Simon, I've shared this with you. I, I work across seven different portfolios right now. The top 20, um, well, actually the top 10 stay pretty much the same. The, towards the bottom of 20, those rotate depending on what the priorities are and what's coming up. And a lot of it is, is at that edge of research. So a big challenge here is um, knowing what I don't know and being willing to admit that and being willing to find the right experts to help me really understand the technologies. For example, if somebody comes to me with a quantum annealing solution, I know about this much about quantum computing, just enough to be dangerous. So yeah. I to experts and I ask them, and I might go to MIT or RIT or Stanford, and I'll say, look, can you tell me more about this capability? This is what I'm seeing. This is how I would like to use it. Will it work for this particular project? And they'll come back and say, well, here's why it will or it won't work. And that's helpful, but you have to be willing to reflect and, and honestly recognize you know, where you do have the depth and where you don't yeah. in order to successfully evaluate that. Um, so it, the other piece is trying to balance across those spaces. That's where the ecosystem also comes into play because we do have a network of experts that can help us to address some of these challenges. And specifically when we're dealing with uh, like the COVID response right now, we brought in a lot of medical experts. We brought in a lot of first responders. We've talked to a lot of people that are say experts in ventilators or PPE and Having them there present to answer the questions has really helped us to refine our focus and identify best op uh, best options for solutions going forward. Yeah, maybe this is a very like good example of of how you work and where your ecosystem comes in. Is the task force about the COVID response? Because um, we've yeah. talked about this just before the talk, um, and I think it's yeah chosen a great and like precise way like where you benefit from, from your network and your ecosystem that you've built up. So maybe just as a brief description for, for our listeners and viewers, what is, what is the COVID response task force and why was, for example, AppWorks put into this um, in order to help and where's, you know, what benefit you can bring into this? So I, I'm excited to share about this because I'm really proud of our team. And uh, when the pandemic happened and we started going to lockdown, a lot of our team members stepped up and they said, look, we've got to do something and we know tech and we can help. So they immediately gathered around and set up the AppWorks Unite and Fight uh, COVID-19 Task Force page, which then turned into the Joint Acquisition Task Force COVID-19 page for whole of Department of Defense. And our team just jumped into action immediately vetting and scouting different technologies. And so Within the first 12 weeks, I think we had reviewed just over 1600 different types of technologies specifically related to the COVID response. And we were talking with health and human services. We were talking with Center for Disease Control. We were talking with a federal emergency management agency um, and pulling everybody together around these different solutions and how we could share them, not just nationally, but internationally too. And so we were also reaching out to teams and a great example, um, one of the ones that I helped with uh, with FDA was the um, mechanical ventilator Milano. That team came together uh, around a Princeton professor, Cristiano Galbiate. He's fantastic. He's actually in Milan. And um, Art McDonald, who is another uh, physicist, and this was an entire team of physicists, Arts in Canada, and everybody else, CERN Labs, Fermi Labs, um, Princeton University, Snow Labs, all came together and volunteered their time to develop a low cost, durable um, ventilator that could keep people alive for multiple weeks to months and had specialty COVID settings. But it was developed initially in Milan with a company there using the doctor's expertise. And then at the same time, we had physicists and scientists from all these labs that volunteered their time around the clock to help build this ventilator, less than a hundred parts, 
less than 5,500 US dollars, and we got it through the FDA in about six weeks for approval. That's the kind of stuff that inspires me. That's, the, that's what I get excited about with our team because you'll see our team doing these kinds of things all the time. And it's super cool because our leadership gives us the flexibility to do that. You tell them, hey, I need to do this and this is what I'm looking at. They're like, go and do, keep me updated. And they let us run with it. And that's, that's a beautiful thing. That doesn't happen too often. So I have another question from, from my coworker, David, and he's, he's interested in when it comes to, because you also do a lot of like coding and experimenting and prototyping. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah so, because we are trying to establish this ourselves and have been doing yes. for, for the past years, but also what we discover is like even when we want to implement prototyping into the existing infrastructure, not just the technical right. one, but also the organizational one or maybe both. Um, right. like how flexible is your core, organi core organization for all this? Um, if you look, yeah, if you look at like more modern solutions, I don't know, like platform one, cloud one, all these things. Um, yeah, yeah we can do prototyping, but sort of want to use it in, in the proper environment. So um, much of the, the cloud one uh, work that's happening right now is happening with Defense Digital Services and our chief data officer. And so that's a bit separate, though we will plug into that. Yeah. We'll bring to bear in those, in those spaces are, are ethical hackers and coders. And that's what gets me really excited because we're bringing in external expertise to highlight to us everything from vulnerabilities to new ways of coding uh, to finding efficiencies in programs uh, to how do we build um, an innovation piece that fits for one of our customers. And that could be you know, leveraging off of an existing makerspace um, or leveraging off of something that, that happens to be a digital makerspace that's globally available. Uh, can we containerize it? In some cases, you might be doing a digital container. We've also done physical containers for 3D printing, CNC machines that you can ship overseas and actually train people in a deployed environment or in an austere environment and give them those capabilities and those technologies. So um, we really have been teaming closely with private sector and academia on a lot of that to bring in the right expertise to help us think differently about it. Because initially we had some good ideas but our ideas got so much better when we started to bring in external partners who had been doing this. And when they're immersed in it, they live and breathe it every day. The ideas that they're having are so much further along than where we are that it just makes sense to have them in our corner coming in and saying, have you thought about this? And what about that? And have you, and that's where we're seeing some really powerful developments happen. But how did you get them committed that much? Like how did you <sighs> build the ecosystem? And, you know, supports you in such a strong way. Yeah, so that took some work. Um, so in 2014, we, uh, we realized there was a big discussion that happened inside of the government that a lot of these um, critical communities, hackers and makers in particular, had become isolated. And part of that was um, both cultural and language differences, because we're all different tribes, we all speak different languages. But um, we had developed a, almost a rift between us where you had a, a divisiveness where I think a lot of it was miscommunication, but also a lot of the hackers that I initially spoke to were very frustrated because they would highlight vulnerabilities and then they would get arrested for it. And people would say, oh, you shouldn't be in there, you shouldn't be, and they're like, but we're trying to help. And so there was a mismatch happening there. Um, so we did a lot of outreach. And a lot of that outreach meant uh, going into rooms where initially people saw me as a fed and it wasn't until later on that they saw me as a friendly fed. But I had to listen because there was a lot of angst and frustration and there was a lot of mistrust on both sides. I still remember um, the first time I brought hackers into Softworks, um, we, had, uh, we had a few gentlemen come in from our senior leadership team and I mentioned, oh, we have our, our hackers here today <laughs> and they're frantically trying to turn off their phones. And I didn't have to tell them that if they really wanted to, that's not gonna help. But, um, you know, so, but I had to introduce them and say, look, they're trying to make a positive difference too. And so um, over the last several years, we've forged a much closer relationship and you can see this. So Simon, we were talking about this earlier, the hack -a -sat, that's coming up. Um, so we last year asked uh, a number of hackers to hack one of our aircraft um, and tell us where all the vulnerabilities were. And they were like, what? Okay, we're in. And they did, and it was incredible. 
this year, we want them to hack an Air Force satellite. And so we started on uh, May 22nd, and we asked teams from around the world to come in. They're going to compete at DEF CON virtually this year. And um, they had to complete a series of different coding challenges and vulnerability challenges, and that stratified them. And now the top 10 teams have been recognized, and August 7th, they will compete for three top prizes as they hack an Air Force satellite and show where the vulnerabilities are, how they can get control of it, could they turn a camera around on it? What are some of the different things they can do that we hadn't thought about and how do we secure against that? And um, by offering uh, opportunities like this and extending trust, we've built a bridge back to the hacker and maker community that's in intensely valuable. Um, another great example that I would recommend for everybody to check out, and it's a great place to start if you want to begin reaching out to the best and the brightest and say, yeah. we want you to come in, is the CTI League, the Cyber Threat Intelligence League. Yeah. Cyber Threat Intelligence League has over 1,400 hackers, ethical hackers, volunteering their time, 70 countries, 20 plus time zones right now. Um, it is impressive because their focus is on how do we secure critical infrastructure around medical facilities, wireless enabled medical devices, banks, schools, government, um, how do we protect it and identify those vulnerabilities so we can proactively prevent attacks? And they're doing this for free around the clock. They self-assembled and for the first time ever, we're seeing our federal partners come together. I'm seeing, you know, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police are coming in on this. We've got you know, Ministry of Defense involved from the UK. We've got our FBI and Cyber Commander involved. Everybody set aside the red tape in favor of coming together during this time to provide a positive presence in cyberspace to protect everybody. That's awesome. That's that's where the real discussions start to happen. So if you want to build, you want to build those relationships a big tent philosophy, be inclusive, invite everybody in and give them a chance to be heard and speak their mind and share their concerns. And then also give them a chance to participate in the way that they're most comfortable with. And that's how you do it. Yeah. We're running towards the end of our time for today now, for the talk at least, but I think, yeah, because I started this talk like trying to compare where the differences are between FWorks and us and other innovation units. and trying to find out what makes you as strong as you are and as successful as you are in many, many ways. Um, even though I, I also think, you know, it, it wasn't always as easy as, as it sounds now in retrospective, maybe. No. Um, <laughs> but certainly, I mean, for me, that's one of the main takeaways is to really try to bring all of the different entities together that actually do have the same mission um, and just work, you know, maybe in parallel or in different branches or in different sectors. Um, just to get, as you, as you said quite well, to get, get them to remove the red tape um, and yeah, just merge all the expertise and the drive that academia and industry are having um, to, to um, march along um, together and into the same direction. But just as a last maybe question, um, because you as a CTO, you, you know, I can, I can tell from the way that you talk that you love the technology that you're working on. But from the past three years that you've been working for Everworks, what was your favorite project? Oh my goodness. Um, so and I've, I've only been with AppWorks for about a year now. I was with Softworks before that. So I'm fairly new to the AppWorks team, but um, favorite project, oh my gosh. Um, that's a tough one because we've had so many. We've had so many. Um, Hmm. Okay, let me let me do two. Let me do one for Softworks and I'll do one for one for Offworks. So um, for Softworks, we were challenged uh, around a counter improvised explosive device um, issue that we we're having in Iraq. And this one always I, I absolutely love this one because we had a young man come forward and um, we were trying to figure out how to identify uh, passive infrared detectors like that were hidden in walls of new buildings where we're trying to move people into these homes and they were getting uh, killed or injured because insurgents were placing bombs in the walls. And so um, he said, he simply said bubbles. And I started to giggle and I, I'm like, is that his name or is that, you know, um, his call sign or, and no, what he meant was bubbles as in a bubble machine. And so, because we were looking for a cheap solution, something that we could give to the Iraqis that they could use and 
he was right. We got a party bubble machine, and when it filled up a room with hot soapy bubbles moving around, that little device would go off every time. And yeah. so, and it worked on a number of passive IR devices. And so this was something that we could quickly give to them, less than twenty dollars, and they could put it on top of a remote control car, drive it in there, and not risk a person or a dog or or a robot. And very quickly clear a space and do it in just you know minutes instead of hours because bubbles everywhere and if something's in there it's going to blow up. And so that was one That's of the you rocket technology, right? <laughs> right, right. And then the other cool solution I would say for for on the AFWORK side that I got really excited about, and I, I touched on this with uh, the drones that we were discussing earlier. This particular drone. Uh, we were able to mount a camera on. And so typically uh, when you're dealing with dents and dings on an aircraft, you have to have an airman crawl around on that aircraft to find where the dent cracks. In this case, we used a high definition camera plus a drone to stitch a full image of that aircraft and very quickly find all the dents and dings. So instead of taking four weeks, we could take a matter of hours to days, find them, repair them, and then have the aircraft ready to go back out again. That was super cool and exciting. That was a lot of fun. And that's, that's even something that you can more time. commercial sector, right? It's not just an Air Force specific thing. Yeah. Yes, yes. And that's the other thing. We try to do um, collaborative dual use efforts where yeah. companies come in, we want them to remain competitive. So we encourage them to engage with incubators, the venture capitalists, the accelerators that we're working with that are um, featuring defense tech portfolios because they're moving fast on that side and they're also finding commercial relevance. But then with us on the, the defense department side and for our partners too, we're able to bring those funds in. They're receiving a steady funding here from the commercial sector, maintaining that competitiveness and then also responding to our requirements until we can get them a full-time program of record. So it's a powerful combo to do that. And we've had some great success working with our private sector partners um, and academic partners. They've been really, really exceptional. And um, when you structure it correctly, you can do some great things together. Okay, so yeah, we are out, out of time now, but um, thank you very much for all these super interesting insights into AppWorks. And I mean, of course, we from the Cyber Innovation Hub, we are following your challenges when you post them online and uh, yes. what to do and where your areas of focus are. Because, I mean, we are cross branch. We're not just Air Force, as I said, but of course, in many, many ways, we deal with the same challenges. For example, we do run a project dealing with tracking of tools in aviation too, for example, just so we take all the same fields here and there, but um, thank you very much for all the like close insights, especially how to build up the ecosystem and how to get people committed and to to like bring in their expertise and all this. So um, I'm very much looking forward to to the future events that you'll be hosting. Um, and even if it's you know just virtually that we can listen and, and join in, we will of course always do so. So thank you very much for your time, JJ, yeah. today. Oh, Simon, thanks so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. Um, please, please reach out. You're always welcome. We would love to have you participate in some of our challenges. We've got several different marketplaces, digital marketplaces. I can send you the links for those. You just need a government um, ID to sign up and it gives you access to the technologies we've scouted. Um, but let's work on some stuff together. I see some really cool synergies here and I would love to find ways to more closely collaborate with you and your team. And then in the future, once everything dies down with the zombie apocalypse, let's try to catch to up in person and we'll see how we can team better together there too. That sounds wonderful. I'll bring you soap bubbles. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> hey, Thank you so much. much. It was so much fun. <laughs> bye bye. Bye now. Bye, everybody. <laughs>